Part 1. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Good morning, Santon Sports Club. Oh, hello. I spoke to one of your colleagues last week about becoming a member of your club, and I'd like to go ahead and join, if I can do it over the phone. Absolutely. I'll start by taking a few details, if I may. Of course. What's your name? It's Alex Coos. Can you spell your surname? It's C-O-O-Z-E. Lovely. I've got that. And are you a student or in employment? Employed. Thank you. And can I ask, what's your job? I'm a doctor. Right. Thanks. Now, we don't need to get your full address at this stage, but could I just take your postcode? If I can remember it. <laughs> I've only just moved. Oh, yes. It's uh, GT1. Right. And then 2BN. Is that V-N? Uh, no, B-N. Sorry. Now, one last question in this section. Can I just ask how you heard about us? Was it from a friend? Actually, I read about the club in a newspaper. It... Uh... That's fine. Thank you very much. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now, we do offer different types of membership according to which facilities you want to use and when. Yes, I gathered that, but my schedule's a bit problematic. I mainly want to use the gym, and that'll be after about 7pm when I finish work. Fine, right. And will you be interested in swimming? I understand you have both an indoor and an outdoor pool. That's right. <laughs> I'm not a fan of swimming, actually, and certainly don't want to be there when it gets very packed in the evenings. Um, I think I'd only want to use the outdoor one and during the day, when I can get a bit of sunbathing in. And when the children are at school, of course, so it's a bit quieter. A lot of our clients prefer that. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine. <laughs> and I might occasionally want to have a game of badminton, you know... Uh, and I suppose I'd like to book courts on Saturdays and Sundays when I can organise a game with friends. Right. And would you be wanting to use our other club facilities, such as the sauna, steam room or tanning bed? They're open all day until 9pm. Well, I think I'd only want to use the steam room and probably after I've been doing heavy exercise. So shall I put that down as evenings? Sorry, no, I'd probably only use it on Saturdays and the occasional Sunday, you know, when I have more time to relax. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15.
Hi, everyone. I'm a bit nervous about doing this, so... Uh, anyway, as you all know, I come from Libya, and I'm going to talk about sandstorms. Sandstorms are very common in the Sahara Desert, and so people in Libya, which is near the Sahara Desert, know all about them. Now, we say sandstorm, but it's not really a storm. There's no rain or thunder and lightning. There are sandstorms when a strong wind picks up sand and carries it. As the wind blows, the sand in the wind causes more sand to move around and that is also picked up. A very strong wind can pick up a huge amount of sand. Look at my first image on the board here. As you can see, a severe sandstorm looks like a huge wall or wave of sand. Can you imagine that coming towards you? Now, I will tell you what you should do if you know a sandstorm is coming, or even if you get caught in a sandstorm. Extract 2 So, have you decided where you're going on holiday yet? You were talking about Spain. No, we've changed our minds. We're going to Egypt for two weeks. Wow, really? When are you going? The second week in August. Egypt in August? You're brave. It'll be absolutely boiling then, won't it? Yeah, that's what I want. We'll go and see the sights early in the morning when it's still quite cool and then lie around by the swimming pool in the midday heat. Hmm. I went to Morocco in the summer a few years ago. I couldn't sleep until about two in the morning. I always said that if I went anywhere like that again, I'd go in the spring or autumn. Well, I can't wait. You just see my tan when I get back. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Good evening, Professor Drake, and welcome to the programme. Good evening. Now, as we have heard, it appears that there are a greater number of hurricanes now, particularly in the Atlantic, and that hurricanes are becoming more violent and causing more damage. First of all, could you explain what causes a hurricane? Uh, yes, certainly. Um, hurricanes, or tropical cyclones as they are also known, are really huge storms, or a number of storms that occur together within a small area. They are caused by low pressure and moist air rising from the Earth's surface, uh, usually the surface of the sea. As the moist air rises, it becomes warmer, and this is what forms the hurricane. If the hurricane is strong enough, it will develop an eye, the eye, which is circular, is at the centre of the hurricane and can be huge, 300 kilometres in diameter perhaps. The eye is usually calm. It is the area around the eye, the eye wall, where the storms occur. The eye wall surrounds the eye like the wall of a huge vertical passage and is made up of the strong winds that cause the damage when the hurricane passes over land. Spreading out from the eye wall is the vast area of clouds and rain that we call the rain bands. These rain bands can spread for hundreds of kilometres. Thank you for that, Professor. Now, why is it that the world is experiencing a greater... Extract 4 Floods occur when the water level rises in an area where there was previously little or no water. Floods can be dramatic. They occur suddenly and the water level rises quickly. Or creeping, the water level rises over a longer period of time. They occur either because there is a larger amount of rainfall in an area than is usual or because ice melts. 
Floods generally cause damage and negatively affect the economy of an area, but they can also be beneficial. The River Nile floods annually, and the water brings nutrients to the soil in surrounding fields. This, of course, means better crops. Most floods occur naturally, but they can be... That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear two students, Jenna and Marco, discussing a business studies project they have to do. You now have 15 seconds to read questions 21 to 24. Come on, Marco. We've got to get on and sort out this project for Professor Buckley. Hang on. I want to make sure we've got all the information. Now, where are we? Well, today we need to sort out exactly what we're going to do and how we're going to divide the work up. OK. How long have we got, by the way? Um, the end of term is April 6th. And he said to hand it in on week 8, so that's March 25th at the latest, because the beginning of that week is the 21st, Ooh. so not long. Right. Have you got the notes there? Yes. He wants us to do a fairly small-scale study, like the last one, on whether or not businesses were offering more benefits to staff. Mm. And we've now got to look at the rise in older workers. It should be fairly straightforward. Yeah, as long as we keep it small. Mm. Who's marking it? I don't know. Sometimes he gets the PhD students to mark it for him. Oh, actually, it just says here, a senior lecturer. Mm. I suppose it's too much for Professor Barclay to do them all. Yeah. Anyway, how are we going to go about this? Well... We have to decide how big we want it to be and who... Yeah, we... but I think we must sort out a timetable for the project. Otherwise, nothing will get done. OK. Uh, do you want to do that? All right. I'll do it as soon as we finish here. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 25 to 30. OK, what do we have to do now for the project? What's the best way to go about it? Um, well, Professor Carter suggested we set up a focus group to get some in-depth interviews, but I think that'll take a lot of time. Yeah, I agree. If we did a focus group, we'd have to spend time deciding who to include in it, and it's not necessary to do one anyway. Oh, fine. And if you agree, I think we should get in touch with the businesses on the list Professor Carter gave us and ask them if they're prepared to participate. Sounds good. Uh, then we can go there, give them questionnaires and collect them later. Exactly. OK. Uh, then do we need to book one of those study rooms in the library so we can work together to input the data? 
Perhaps not, as I guess just one of us could just sort it out, actually. Yes, that would be easier. A lot of what we're doing is qualitative, so it'll be writing up rather than statistics. No software for that, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> and I think it would look better if we had actual shots of some of the staff, because we're citing appearance as a factor in employability, aren't we? Yeah, OK. I'll factor that all in when I sort everything out tonight. I'm glad we decided to work together. I think it's going to work out well. Yes, well, given that we had to work in pairs on this project, I think we were right to choose each other. Hmm. We complement each other academically, as we're each good at what the other isn't. <laughs> in fact, we should have tried working together before. <laughs> yes. Now, how shall we split the work? I'll do the analysis, shall I? Oh, OK. It's just that it might be faster, because I'm used to doing it. Although your English is better than mine. I need more practice at reading, really. OK, I'll do the presentation then, if that's OK with you. Yeah, sure. I don't mind speaking in public, but I hate preparing all the notes for them. The thing is, the tutor said one person should do the whole presentation, and he said he expects me to do it because I haven't done one yet. No, that's fine. Now, let's see. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. This morning, I'd like to look at the whole issue of contemporary art. What it is, how do we interpret it, what are its uses, and does art, in effect, have any advantages or disadvantages for society? First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Welcome to this series of lectures on interpreting contemporary art. This morning, I'd like to look at the whole issue of contemporary art. What it is, how do we interpret it, what are its uses, and does art, in effect, have any advantages or disadvantages for society? I think at this point, it's important for me to clarify that I am looking at art from two main perspectives. Firstly, Art as something made by and appreciated by individuals. And secondly, art's relationship with society, as it is society that supports, protects and encourages art. And I'm hoping that this lecture will act as a springboard for you to revisit your own artistic experiences and question your own ideas of what contemporary art means. Throughout this series of lectures, I'll be looking at various examples of art to illustrate my points. However, if at any point I show you an example which is unfamiliar, then please tell me, as it is imperative that you be able to use your past experiences so that you can check to see if your ideas agree with mine. So if you have not seen a particular work of art before, then this will not work. And let me remind you now that at the end of these lectures, you will be given a written assignment which will consist of a 2,500-word critical essay. This is not an art review, but an analysis of what you think this kind of art means. OK, so what is contemporary art? Well, my view is that contemporary art reflects a particular time in history. In terms of Western civilization, this is the period that became known as the Renaissance, which began roughly in 1450. 
But this becomes confusing as the modern era is also considered to be from 1789, from the time of the French Revolution. Added to this are modern ideas and modern art that developed from 1890. This period has also been called the turn of the century. To try and somehow bring all these periods together, I shall define contemporary art as any art created from 1920 up until the present day. Turning now to the question of whether or not art is useful for society,、uh, well, when we look back at the history of the West, we can see that there has been a tradition, especially in Western Europe, of art that was official. This meant that the government sponsored or subsidized the art. It could be said, therefore, that art has a cultural use, in that it can represent both the culture and history of a country. And、um, let's remember what I said earlier, that this is both the history and culture of a particular time. Now, the disadvantage of this kind of official art is that it tends to be academic. And by that I mean it is art that requires the person looking at it to be educated in art, at least to some extent. So it seems to me that this restricts this type of art to a particular social group. And whether you agree with this concept or not will depend on if you believe that art should be accessible to everyone. Of course, with the rapid developments in technology and advertising. The television, computer, and various forms of digital media, art has changed, and although there will always be a need for art to be subsidised by governments, we see today art forms that are surviving on individual subsidy. Sometimes this is through the support of wealthy patrons, such as businessmen or famous people, but it also operates on a more simple level.、Uh, I refer here to the art that is done on walls and in streets, sometimes called amateur art. But it is the art of graffiti, and it is now accepted as an art form in itself. So here we come to what I see as another advantage for society, in that art is a means by which people can express their ideas, their feelings. Of course, in the case of graffiti, there is much debate as to whether the advantages outweigh the more negative side, which is when graffiti artists paint on public buildings. This creates unnecessary expense and also damages these buildings, which are meant for public use. We will be looking at some examples of this later on. Now, many critics of contemporary art have pointed to art that is often violent and、uh, even obscene. But I would like to suggest that such art is not meant to only shock us; it also has the element of exposure, so it can teach us about the violence in society. This then brings us to another advantage of art: it can raise awareness, help us see things in a different light. The disadvantage of this is that art can be dangerous. Um. What I'm saying here is that if we accept that contemporary art has the power to influence our feelings and attitudes, then we have to accept that art can evoke negative feelings like anger, as much as it can give us feelings of hope and peace. But art is, after all, about us, so it can be about our beliefs and our behaviour. And as human beings, we possess both positive and negative traits. I'd like to show you some slides now to illustrate what I've been talking about. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.